Hello, and welcome to the second episode of The Punch Show. Uh, there may or may not be puns involved today. We'll see how that goes. Um, today I wanted to talk about the economy and Trump's economy versus Biden's economy and even what Harris's economy might mean. Uh, there is a reason for this, and that is because nobody's really talking about specifics. Uh, it's uh, or nuances. It's just gotten kind of weird how we gloss over things and uh, rationalize some of the things Trump has done and ignore some of the things that he says he wants to do. So let's just dive in here and start looking at the economy over the last, uh, what, I guess 16 years now since, since uh, Obama took office. Now, if you'll remember, in 2008, there was a big housing bubble, and it burst, and that drove us into a recession. It caused the GDP to shrink. It caused, uh, you know, like, I think it was the worst economic collapse up to that, to that point since the Great Depression. And so when Obama took office, he did not take over a robust economy or a growing economy. He took over a, an economy that was in a borderline state of collapse. And uh, through his economic policies, it rebounded and it started to grow again. And I think when he left office, and uh, for instance, unemployment was around 6%. He'd gotten it down to 6%. And then Trump was running on this notion of uh, economic st instability. Everybody kept talking about or the ec economic anxiety, that's what they called it. It was all about economic anxiety. There was this anxiety uh, that was driving his voters. And what this anxiety was or where it came from or what it meant, none of that really was ever discussed. It was just there was anxiety. Oh, we're anxious about the economy. And uh, so then Trump took office. And all of a sudden, the day he took office, it was like all the economic anxiety went away, which makes you wonder if it was really about economic anxiety and not about, you know, like skin pigment or something like that. And so uh, once the white guy was in charge, everybody felt safer about the economy. And he didn't really, if you, if you look at his legislative record, not much got passed in terms of the economy under him. It was mostly just... Uh, he uh, did use his uh, executive authority to take away some regulations, and he did get his tax policy passed, but it didn't really have that much effect on the economy. It just had more of an effect on the budget through the first three years. And uh, I, if you even if you look at the the, the, the scale of growth from what was under Obama to under Trump, growth actually slowed under Trump uh, than uh, under Biden or than under Biden's. I'm sorry, under Obama's last three years, uh, once he had kind of righted the ship and gotten things going again. Um, and you know, people act like the economy is this thing where the day the president takes office, it's he get it's an etch a sketch, and they just shake the etch a sketch, and there's a clean slate, and then whatever happens from there on out is is, uh, you know, that president's doing, and it's more like a uh, battleship and turning around a battleship. So if the battleship is going full speed. You can't just stop on a dime and then come back the opposite direction at the same speed. You have to like slow down first. You have to turn. It's a process. It's not an event. And um, this is, you know, what happened with, with Obama. He, he took over the economy. He uh, got some uh, stimulus spending passed and slowly the economy started to rebound. And the, uh, aggregation of that was what we, you know, want to give Trump credit for was really just the continuation of Obama's economy, although it did slow down a little bit. If you actually look at the, the graph that, uh, which, you know, I'll have up here, the, the graph that, that shows actual 
uh, spending and our actual, you know, GDP growth under both Trump and Obama. So then Obama, or so then Trump got to 2020, and he gloss, he kind of tried to gloss over the pandemic, and you know, by most people's metrics, made it worse. Uh, he sort of belittled it. He called it a cold. He said it'll go away. He blamed it. He called it a hoax. He called it the China virus to inject some racism in there. He did a lot of things. Uh, talking about the, the virus, is missing the virus. And then uh, when he finally relented and uh, let the experts have their way in terms of shutting down the economy, they turned it into this thing where it was like, okay, for two weeks, and it didn't even really last two weeks. It's like, for some people, it was only like a week, but you can open up the economy again, but that doesn't mean people are going to be running pell-mell into, you know, uh, walking around breathing in the coronavirus for, you know, no reason at all. Although some people stupidly did so. Um, but some of the jobs started to come back under Trump, but not most of them. And it wasn't until the virus or the, the um, vaccine was was uh, released, the, the various vaccines were released, that we started to have some hope, right? And to Trump's credit, he uh, had the Operation Warp Speed, which was not actually, as some people think, that did not, you know, create the, 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 the vaccine. The vaccine was already there by the time Operation Warp Speed came around. They had already figured out how to vaccinate. Uh, but the issue was that there are different levels of testing that are needed to go through. And... Normally, you would go like step one, step two, step three, step four. And with warp speed, it's like, let's just do them all at the same time so that we can get it faster. The uh, this, the need for speed will save more lives than, you know, the, the cautious approach. So the vaccine had technically come out right before he left office, but it was after the election, uh, people started getting vaccinated. But there was no real plan to distribute the vaccine on a mass level until Biden took office. And then when Biden took office, he uh, nationalized some things and made it so that we could expedite uh, the, the delivery of the vaccine. But then the, the, the right-wingers uh, started getting all weird about, you know, vaccine injuries and, you know, stuff that was just a complete misunderstanding of uh, what, what all of that is. And, uh, but enough people got vaccinated that we, you know, we were like around 80, 90 percent. And then the, the, the people that didn't get vaccinated kind of took care of themselves by just getting COVID so that they wouldn't have to get COVID which made no sense to me. But, you know, like the natural immunity crowd is like, you know how you get natural immunity, right? It's by getting COVID. So you're like literally arguing, oh, if I get COVID, I won't have to get COVID. And you don't understand why I'm mocking you for that. But I am, I'm mocking you. If that's your opinion, I am literally mocking you. Mock, 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 mock. So, okay, um, the... Uh, the vaccine came out, and then shortly after that, the, 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 the jobs started to really rebound. And by six months into office, Biden had recovered almost completely the job market because people were safe to go back to work. And there's this false narrative that has come out uh, that those jobs were just going to happen. Um, and so it's like it's dismissed as giving credit to Biden for those jobs coming out. And it's like, number one, 
the that idea that the jobs just came back ignores a few things. It ignores one, the vaccine distribution and its effect on that. Like people felt safer because they were safer. And number two is it ignores the stimulus spending that uh, accounted for so many of those jobs. And there's this kind of like, oh, well, you know, you took away the jobs and then after they went back, then people could just go back to the same jobs. And that's not what happened. When you look at the jobs that were lost in, you know, like February and March of 2020, the first jobs that went were the, the hospitality jobs and the, um, the jobs at like movie theaters and restaurants and hotels and things like that. And the, the, those were the first ones to go because that's where you, you know, you went and you aggregated and that aggregation uh, was dangerous. And so once it was safe, then you could start reopening. But those weren't the first jobs that came back. The first jobs that came back were uh, the, the, uh, the, when people came back to work, they weren't coming back to the same jobs. And this is really important. We'll get into it later. It wasn't the same jobs. It's not like somebody worked at, you know, this, this restaurant as a waiter, lost their job, and then came back a year later and started working as a waiter again. There was a lot of, uh, with the new jobs and with a change in industry on a, on a certain level as, pe you know, as, as the economy sift shifted, there were new jobs available that weren't previously available, and these were higher paying jobs. Um, so, and then a lot of these higher paying jobs were also available because they were from stimulus funding. So those were the jobs that were filled first. Then, and remember, like, how there was all this stuff about, you know, oh, I had to wait 20 minutes for my McDonald's order because all these people are sitting home collecting welfare and, and unemployment instead of going back and working at McDonald's. No, that's, that wasn't it at all. The unemployment rate showed that people were working. They were just weren't working in the, that McDonald's job because they had found new higher paying jobs. So why would they quit? their higher paying job and then go work at McDonald's so that they can get yelled at by Karen McCarran. Um, the, 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 uh, the whole thing was silly. So finally, those jobs did start to um, fill in. And basically, since 2021, since the summer of 2021, we've had unemployment right around 4%, you know, it'll shift up 4.2, 4.3%. It's, it's been below 4% for a number of months. Uh, but it's been right around 4%. And full employment is considered 5%. And to put things in perspective, because we look at this and we say, well, uh, this is, you know, this would have happened anyway. And in 2020, the Congressional Budget Office did a report and they looked at where the economy was and what, what expected growth would be. And they thought that by the end of 2024, if we were doing well, unemployment would be around 6%. Well, obviously we've beaten the pants off of that projection. But when we look at this, we need to consider not just where we are compared to where we were in 2019, but where we are compared to where we were expected to be in 2020. And where we were expected to be in 2020 is nowhere near where we've been at for the last three years. Okay, so now let's talk about the inflation. Uh, there is this myth that all the inflation was caused by Biden's spending. And here, first of all, I'd like to touch on a little irony to this. If the inflation was caused by Biden's spending, then you're going to fault him for that. But in order for the inflation to be caused by Biden's spending, then that means 
the reason that the inflation happened is all this extra money that went into creating federal jobs and then secondarily private jobs all that extra money meant people had extra money in their pocket that they were spending so you can't separate the uh, inflation from the jobs but you want to give Biden, Biden the blame for the inflation but not give him credit for the jobs that doesn't make sense so like just pinhole that for a minute um, then the other thing is we're looking at inflation versus wage growth and for the first year of inflation uh, inflation was outpacing wage growth and that makes a big difference if you're uh, making a hundred dollars a year and or if you're you know for every hundred dollars you make inflation is ten percent that means now what you were gonna buy for a hundred dollars is gonna cost hundred and ten dollars but if inflate if wage growth is 20 percent then you have hundred and twenty dollars to buy that hundred and ten dollars worth of stuff so you have to look at wage growth compared to inflation and the economists call that real wage growth um, and it's it's wage growth adjusted for inflation so under Biden uh, as a report from like last year I think uh, the last quarter of last year uh, wage growth was up 26 percent compared to uh, the the inflation which was 20 percent so which is higher 26 or 20 which number is higher 26 or 20 you tell me 26 20 um, so the average American their prices went up 20 percent but their wages went up 26 percent so you tell me is that a deal for the worker or not because I would rather have my income go up higher than my cost of living because that means that I have more money at the end of the paycheck then the other thing is with inflation there's a lot of sort of disingenuous stuff that the Republicans have been doing like factoring in the cost of a mortgage uh, and so there's they'll say things like oh because the Fed rate went up and the mortgage rate went up now it's gonna cost you 50% more for your home which you know or whatever it is they say which it's like how many times do you buy a new house in the last four years how many times how many new homes have you bought in the last four years uh, most people aren't buying a new new house every year you know what I'm saying so the idea that this more you know, the, the mortgage is, is, is gone up is, 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 is just it's 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 dishonest and especially because the president doesn't set the Fed rate the Fed rate is set by the Fed and the uh, the Fed raised and raised the interest rate to lower inflation now the logic behind this is it makes sense if you're going to invest money then and you you're gonna borrow money to invest it then you're going to need to get more money back from your investment than you are going to pay in the interest on that investment or on on the loan so you know like if you have a take out a hundred thousand dollar loan and your return rate is five percent but your inflation or your your um, uh, interest rate is seven percent you're gonna lose money on that investment so you're not gonna make the investment since you're not gonna make the investment you don't put that money into the economy that doesn't stimulate the economy it slows down the economy then because the economy is slowing down and people are spending less money it causes prices to come down 
And so the, the, there's like a balance that the Fed tries to keep between interest rates and inflation. And you want them to kind of go up similarly and down similarly. And you want to have a certain amount of inflation, like around 2%, because if you have inflation, that means the economy is growing. If you don't have inflation, that means the economy is not growing and you want the economy to grow. Um, so blaming Biden for the interest rate going up is again like blaming him for having a good enough economy that the interest rates had to go up and so they had to slow it down. And so it's like this kind of um, disingenuous, dishonest way of looking at the economy that has become sort of mainstreamed where Biden gets all the blame for anything negative, even if it's an indication of something positive, like the wage growth and the low unemployment rates. Um, so that's the first thing is just to like get things beyond you know, the, 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 the post hoc kind of reasoning we have where it's just because somebody was president when something happened, that means that that thing happened because he was president and beyond, and also to look at things beyond what the president actually has control over and what the president doesn't have control over. The inflation, for instance, was not exclusively because of Biden. I won't say it's an entirely independent of Biden, um, but there are other factors involved. There are mitigating factors. There's um, the, the fact that there was a, a supply chain shortage. So we didn't have computer chips and those computer chips not being available meant we couldn't build as many new cars. And because we couldn't build as many new cars, we couldn't sell as many new cars. And because the pandemic had ended, there was more demand for new cars. And that demand for new cars, coupled with the reduction of supply in new cars, meant that the price of new cars went up. And then if you shift that, the price of new cars going up meant that the price of used cars went up because people would say, I can't afford a new car, so they would get a used car. And then so the price of used cars went up. So that's like directly the, the, the supply chain affected the new cars, but indirectly it, it affected the used cars. Uh, there were other things that happened, like there was an avian bird flu that wiped out half the nesting population of chickens, of egg-laying chickens in the United States, which caused the price of eggs to go up because, again, supply and demand. There was fewer eggs, more people, or, you know, the same number of people wanting eggs, so that drove the price of eggs up. Unless Donald Trump had a magic cure for the avian bird flu that he didn't have for the pandemic, then how is he going to stop that? How is that Biden's fault? How is Trump being president going to change the price of eggs going up? Or, you know, a few other things. Uh, or similar things in the pork industry. Uh, we, we have to, again, like if we want to really talk about the economy, we have to talk about it honestly, and that means talk about the nuances instead of just saying, oh, you're making excuses, you're making excuses. No, that's not an excuse. That's a valid reason. If uh, you're driving your car and somebody swerves in front of you and crashes into you, it doesn't mean you're making excuses. If you say somebody crashed into you, it just means somebody crashed into you. Uh, there, there are things that happen that are not one person's fault. Uh, the uh, So the next thing is, uh, let's talk about uh, the, this, uh, not just what has happened, but what, what is going to happen. Let's talk about the future, because we are not talking about Trump redoing 
his previous presidency. He's not inheriting the same economy, and he's not promising to do the same things. And some of the things he is promising to do would have devastating consequences on our economy. First and foremost of which is mass deportations. And there are currently about 11 million uh, undocumented workers in the United States. And they are in various industries, but mostly they're in the agriculture industry and the construction industry and the hospitality industry. And that's because those are a lot of those jobs are jobs that um, Americans don't want to do. Uh, so they do them. Uh, so if you look at the number of Americans that are working in the or if you look at the number of undocumented workers in the agriculture industry, it makes up about 50 percent of whatever you're talking about. Um, you know, whether it's harvesting produce or uh, meat packing or the uh, milking the cows, you know, it's roughly half. You know, some there, 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 there's there's some room in there based on what particular aspect you're talking about and where it is for instance you know like in uh in wisconsin 71 percent of the dairy product are are you know are done by undocumented workers so you know if you think about wisconsin without their dairy industry that could have a devastating impact on wisconsin's economy and so there's this this notion that okay these jobs will be just the, the, these are immigrants taking away American jobs. But, you know, the, the, the dairy worker in Wisconsin is making like 30, 35 grand a year. How many people from, you know, Texas are going to move to Wisconsin so that they can milk cows? Uh, how many people in Wisconsin want to milk cows? It's not like these jobs are being taken from Americans. They are being taken because Americans don't want them. And so if you deport people, then what happens is these jobs just don't get done. Okay, so then what happens is either, A, you have to pay, you know, Americans a lot more to do the same job, which is gonna cause inflation, right? Because if you have to pay your workers more, then you have to pay, um, you have to charge more for your product and uh that that makes a big difference the the second thing is maybe they just don't do them maybe maybe they just give up and the the, the reason is like uh you you you, you might want to say okay so half our dairy industry is done by undocumented workers right so the other half is there. So then we, we lose half our dairy industry. But what happens is actually the dairy farm closes down because they can no longer get enough employees to run a profit. So, you know, like that dairy farm, 100% of it is gone, not 50% of it. Uh, and so... The end result ends up being that the people that were investing in these industries say, okay, we're going to go to a less labor-intensive place to invest our money because it's just the cost of labor has gotten too high. So there's been um, studies of places where they've gone through and tried to do these mass deportations. And it's not just the jobs the immigrants are doing that are lost, it's jobs Americans are doing that are lost. And on average, for every uh, one million immigrants you deport, you lose, in addition to those jobs, you lose another 80,000 jobs from people that are American citizens. So deporting 11 million people will not only have a tremendous advantage 
or a tremendous impact on those various industries, it will also have a tremendous impact on unemployment because you've just 80 times 11 million, 80,000 times 11 million, it comes out to like 900 and some thousand, right? So like, let's just round it off to a million. Uh, so you, lo you lost a million American jobs and you shut down all these businesses and you raised the price of dairy and you raised the price of agriculture and you raised the price of meat. So if you think of it in your terms of your, your, your Happy Meal or your value meal at McDonald's, you know, putting it in things in terms that Donald Trump can understand, um, your, the, the cost of your meat went up, the cost of your cheese went up, the cost of your lettuce went up, the cost of your tomatoes went up, the cost of your onions went up, the cost of your salad dressing went up because that's got all those, uh, you know, it's got, got various produce type things in it, I assume. I don't know. I got eggs. Uh, so what have you done? You've, you've caused inflation and you've lowered unemployment. All right, and you've, you, you've caused unemployment to go up. So what do you call that when unemployment goes up and interest rates go up? It's called stagflation. It would be worse than with Jimmy Carter. But you've also caused a food shortage, which is going to create a whole other array of problems. So, like, this is just one aspect. The, you know, and, and then you look at, well, what about the construction industry? What's it going to do, do to that? And we look at the housing crisis, right? Why do we have a housing crisis? In large part because nobody's building new homes. Um, so since not enough homes are being built, if you make it even harder to build those homes, then you're going to have even fewer homes being built, which means there are going to be more demand for the same number of homes, which is going to mean prices go up. Then in addition to that, you've also got, I think it's uh, 3.7 million immigrants, undocumented immigrants, currently own homes. So once you start deporting everybody, then those homes are, those mortgages are going to default, which is going to cause the banks to have issues. So you're talking about compounding a lot of problems through mass deportations. And I've looked at some of the different economic uh, forecasts for the different presidents. And what's sad is none of them really consider the just the monumental damage uh, that mass deportations would have on the economy. Then if you go beyond the mass deportations and you look at some of the other things like the tariffs, uh, he's set talking about, you know, 200% tariff on China and 20% tariff on everything else, which is going to cause even more inflation. And so it's, it's like, you know, you just go back to the food. Okay. You've made it more expensive to uh, domestically sell this produce and you've made it so that it's more expensive to import it so what is that going to do that's going to just drive the prices up even more and it's funny because we talk so much about oh biden inflation you know and we ignore the fact that biden did not cause inflation the pandemic did and then we, we look at Trump and we ignore just the massive amount of inflation that his policies that he's proposing would cause. These are not made up things. These are not even things that are in Project 2025. These are on, things he is on the record as having said. These are campaign promises that he is making. So uh, then you, you add in another thing, which is just the instability that investors, investors like stability. They like to know things aren't going to be chaotic and insane. 
and you've got Trump talking about uh, he's going to prosecute Google for not having an algorithm that promotes positive stories about him. Or he's going to prosecute, you know, everybody that's ever said anything negative about him. Uh, he's talking about a mass day of violence, whatever that means. He, like, he's talking about things that are just nuts. And those things will cause instability, which will cause less investment because people don't want to invest in an insane market. And then that less investment will cause the stock market to crash, which will cause people to lose their savings, which will cause more economic chaos, which will again have a loop effect and cause more problems. So just the, the sheer instability that is Trump is another negative impact on the economy. And finally, He's talking about doing things like shutting down the Department of Education. And right there, like just on the sheer economic side of it, there's 750,000 people employed by the Department of Education. And then, you know, some of the other things. When you're talking about just like getting rid of a million uh, federal employees, that's still a million jobs. That's a lot of impact on the economy. So... Everything he does, every single promise of his seems like it's going to either cause inflation or cause unemployment. So I don't get any, I, I, it's beyond me why anybody would look at what he's saying and doing and saying, yeah, this man would be good for the economy. All they look at is his tax policies, you know, and oh, well, he's going to cut taxes for the billionaires. And so that's going to, you know finally make the trickle-down theory work. And so, no, it won't. He would be devastating for the economy. So now let's look at Harris, okay? And let's look at when somebody actually has a fact and nuance-based approach to the economy, how much of a difference that can make. So, for instance, with the housing crisis, first of all, she's not promising to deport undocumented workers. She's actually looking at how can we provide a pathway to citizenship? But uh, the housing crisis itself is an issue that, again, like some of these other things, is nuanced and not simple. Uh, but in a certain sense, it is in that with so many of the things we've been talking about, it's an issue of supply and demand. And we have more demand than we have supply, which is why the prices are going up. Uh, there are some other issues that compound it, though, which is, you know, for instance, um, investors are buying up a large percentage of the lowest priced homes, which are the ones that most new families would be buying into. Um, most people don't, you know, buy a mansion with their first home. They buy... They buy, the, they buy what they can afford, and they can't afford that much. And so investors are also looking at, they want to buy as low as they can. So like 26% in the fourth quarter of 2023, 26% of new homes, or of, um, I'm sorry, low-priced homes were bought by investors. And so that means there's only 74% for those people that are like families to, to, to get, which means there's they have to pay higher they ha and and they you know they have to bid more and they have to pay more and then uh that part of why new homes are going up or why 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 the price of housing is going up that the republicans don't talk about so kamala harris or kamala harris her solution is actually pretty smart. What do you do if you have more demand than supply? You increase the supply. So she wants to get, you know, through tax incentives and some other things, she wants to create 3 million new homes. Uh, then people buy those homes. And if you uh, are a first time home buyer and uh, you've been paying your rent and you can show you've been paying your rent, 
and you're, you know, a stable person with a stable job, you can get, uh, I think it's a $50,000 tax incentive to buy your home. So that gives the middle class guy that's just trying to buy a home for his family gives him footing to, to compete against the investor because the investor just has more money. The investor isn't restricted to buying what they can afford. They can, they, they're only worried about whether or not they can make money off of it. And so if they can still make money off of it, they can bid even more than the middle class guy. Well, now the middle class guy can, has, ha, ha, has, a, has the means to uh, pay more. So you, you lowered the price through an increase in supply and you've raised the ability of the middle class person to buy a new home. So this is an actual solution to the home shortage. It's not just uh, yelling about the problem. Uh, you look at some of the other things that she's doing. Um, like an another aspect of inflation was in some industries you have like two or three people that are two or three corporations that control most of the market. And the reason we have laws against monopolies is that monopolies can control the prices. So if you're, if you're the only one that provides this need, then you can charge as much as you want and people can't take their business elsewhere because there is no elsewhere. Well, if you have two or three corporations agreeing, hey, let's all just charge 20% more. It's the same dynamic in effect. You, you, you have to pay more because there's nowhere else to go. So uh, what Kamala Harris wants to do is make it so that it's illegal to do that and to, you know, what she calls price gouging. No, you cannot collaborate with your competition to raise prices so that all of you can pay, you know, charge more money and all of us have to pay more money. Um, and if you're a capitalist, she, you know, I see people calling her a communist for price fixing. Actually, this is, this is capitalism. This is, this is saying, no, if you're going to be in a capitalist country, you have to play by capitalist rules to where supply and demand actually have a chance to work. And what you're doing is you're just jacking up the prices and getting rid of the, the competition so that supply and demand does not work anymore. Um, and, 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 and that's just the bottom line is capitalism can't work without competition. Uh, so she's like, okay, we need to pass legislation that makes this illegal. I have not heard one critic of that policy actually honestly address what the policy is. They say that she's trying to fix price. She's not trying to say you can't charge more than $1.50 for a head of lettuce. She's saying that these three companies can't get together and, de and decide let's all charge 20% more for a head of lettuce since nobody else can buy lettuce or, you know, since, since, since nobody can get lettuce from anywhere else. All right. So she's actually trying to adjust things that caused inflation and, you know, like the, 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 the supply chain shortage, it's mostly over, but we have to get, give credit to the, the uh, Democrats here. For instance, with the chips, they passed the chips act which will allow more chips to be built in the United States or manufactured in the United States so that we're not as dependent on other countries for those. Uh, the, the, the For the most part, She's not all that different from Biden or, you know, like your typical Democrat. But, you know, your typical Democrats are the ones that have been 
recovering the economy and strengthening the economy for the last 40 years, every single, every single Republican since 1988, when Bush one took office, every Republican that's held office left the office with the recession. And every single Democrat has left office with the economy in a much better state than they found it. So, you know, the, 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 the Democratic policies are clearly working better than Republican policies. But again, we can't have facts injected into this conversation about the economy. We can only be talking about how, you know, Republicans are better and Democrats are worse, even though the opposite is true. And the reason that I think that, that we have so much of this is that so much of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the thinkosphere or whatever you want to call it on the economy is financed by conservatives and right-leaning policy. And most of that funding is from billionaires. And so, or, you know, like if not billionaires, at least the extremely wealthy who are affected in some way by uh, the Democrat uh, view of the economy to where like pro progressive taxes are better. And, and, and honestly, it's, it's a little bit insane that somebody like Elon Musk could complain about taxes because he had to pay $10 billion in taxes. Well, if you're worth $150 billion and you have to pay $10 billion in taxes, that means you only have $140 billion after you paid your tax bill. Um, if you make $25,000 and you have to pay $5,000 in taxes, that means you only have $20,000 after you pay your tax bill. So it's not about what you pay. It's about what you have left. And... There is zero difference in Elon Musk's life than there was before he had to pay $10 billion in taxes. Like, there is nothing he can't go out and buy. He can go out and he, he went out and he bought Twitter. He bought Twitter after he paid that. And he's still rich beyond comprehension. But the woman, the single mom, who's going to lose her son's education that's in special ed because you got rid of the Department of Education, and whose food prices went up through the roof, you know, she's, she's the one that feels things. So... Yeah, I don't have a problem giving her a $6,000 tax credit. Because, you know, her kids need to eat. And Donald, or, you know, Elon Musk is not going hungry. He's not going, oh, you know, I used to be able to afford Subway, but now I have to, you know, I just make my own sandwich. He's not, he's not suffering. He's not missing anything at all. So why, why, why does it matter if he spends $10 billion or $5 billion in taxes? Why? Why does it matter? It's just a different number that's his net worth. That's all. It makes no practical difference at all to Elon Musk how much he pays in taxes. But it makes a difference to the single mom or to the dad who's a family of four and he's the only one with an income. Or to the person with an autistic child who needs the Department of Education because the Department of Education funds basically all of the special needs funding for children in this country. So if you're talking about, you know, the economy and you want to talk about what really affects the ordinary person, please don't tell me that the person that makes real wages go up that wants to give you a tax credit for your family that wants to help you buy a new home 
that that person is the person that's bad for the economy. And the person who just, out of some sort of whatever Adderall injected weirdo dream he had, decided that the, the only problem with America was all these undocumented immigrants, and he just wants to send everybody back, regardless of the effect on the economy. And no matter how many people's lives he ruins, um, like he's the bad guy. Or he's the, he's the good guy. He's the guy that's going to save you. No, he's not. He's going to destroy the country. And just one other thing that's related to what happened this weekend with the, uh, the, the hurricanes. And first, you know, sincerely prayers to everyone, whether you vote for Republican or Democrat, Trump or Harris or RFK Jr. or whatever. I don't, I don't care, you know. Uh, who you voted for. I, I, I want you to have a full recovery from, you know, the disaster. Uh, nobody deserves to just lose their home because the weather came through. So, you know, I'm just glad we have programs like FEMA that will help you with that. And I would hope that you would consider that as you're cashing your FEMA check as you're taking your help from FEMA. That Donald Trump wants to end it. That the next storm that blows through, if you vote for Donald Trump, FEMA won't be there to help you. Everybody, you know, since Reagan said, oh, the scariest things you can ever hear are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. No. The government is here to help and the government has helped. And this demonization of the government uh, while at the same time you receive the help from the government. It just doesn't make sense to me. And, you know, I want you to be able to, to recover. But does Trump want you to be able to recover? And I want you to really think about that. When you get that FEMA check, if you live in rural North Carolina or rural Florida, when, you, when, when, when you're getting that help, I just want you to think about it. Will Donald Trump be there for you? Because he's already promised he won't. He's going to devastate the economy. He's going to make it so that when you're trying to rebuild, there are not people there to rebuild for you. There won't be money given to rebuild for you. It's, it's, it's like the, the damage Trump is going to do to this economy is lost on this kind of normalization of things to where people are just looking at his tax policy and, and filtering that through the whole, you know, Keynesian scheme or whatever. It's not, it's not the same. It's different. It's different this time. That's why so many Republicans are endorsing Kamala Harris, because it's different. It's going to destroy the economy on ways that we may not recover from. It's not just democracy that's at threat. It's your livelihood. So, anyway, go look at the pictures of Asheville. Before you vote, look at the pictures of Asheville. And you just ask yourself, do we need to get rid of FEMA? So, anyway... That was episode two. Hopefully some things have been improved. I got the microphone. I got the green screen. Um, I'll try learning some other things as I go forward. But thanks for coming. Bye.